We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We'll say a very special welcome to Progressive High School from Fort Bend Independent School District and Moses E. Molina from the Dallas Independent School District. Uh, teachers, if you are watching and you have not registered, please go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up, please. This is just for our attendance records. Uh, the program will be going green during this virtual field trip. Students will explore the advantages and disadvantages of going green, such as organic gardening and farming, natural methods of pest control, hydroponics, zero scaping, energy efficient homes and appliances and hybrid cars. Ms. Nash will present a program called Organic Gardening. Mr. Monroe will tell you about natural methods of pest control. Ms. Ramirez will cover zero scaping and Ms. Fuller will do solar panels and Ms. Jackie will do electronics recycling. Uh, you cannot ask us verbal questions during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer. Send us your questions in. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I will send the answers to your teachers. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Ms. Nash is going to present a program called Organic Gardening. Hello, welcome to my classroom. And I have a little friend here who's trying to escape my clutches. Can you see that little caterpillar? So this is why organic gardening and farming is important. It starts right here, okay, with the plant that starts that food chain. So if this little caterpillar ate a plant that had all kinds of pesticides on it, that little caterpillar might die. And if a bird ate it before it died, the bird might get sick. So we need to always remember that everything is connected. So all that stuff that we put in our world doesn't go anywhere. It just goes somewhere else. I'm putting him back in his little quasi habitat there. And we'll look at some pictures of organic gardens. Okay, One of my favorite things to, to uh, talk about and do. So organic gardening just depends on not using any, any chemical, pesticides, or fertilizers. So plants grow just fine. If you look at the forest near you or a grassland near you, a wild place that no one's using or manipulating, things are growing great. And the animals and the birds and insects are all happy and healthy for it. So here's some flowers, okay, that are growing just fine with no, no pesticide no chemical fertilizer. Okay. A few more beautiful ones. The bees and the butterflies are safe to drink their nectar and the caterpillars are safe to eat the leaves. And then the birds come along and eat the caterpillars and everyone's safe. And we can also grow our own food in a safe way without chemical fertilizer or pesticide and they grow just fine. These are my little gardens I have, okay. And um, things are just kind of starting to grow. The squash is tiny, bigger now. This was a week or so ago. Got tomatoes going, all kinds of things. Here's some onions and a big row of potatoes. Now this is in a, a little a community garden where I have a plot, and we have a big, big plot that we grow different things to donate to the food banks around. So right now we have a bunch of onions and potatoes growing. We're going to harvest those and see the onions here are ready to go. The potatoes are growing really well. And all of this is grown without any kind of artificial fertilizer or pesticide. Now we do get potato beetles, but we go out there and we just squish them with our fingers. Squish, it's a kind of a fun thing to do. And we get a lot of them that way. So this is what I pulled out of my garden just a week ago, and I've got leeks growing, some lettuce still there, a couple pe peppers that were really early, I thought, and then my weird the purple things are called kohlrabi. Okay. So they're really to eat. So I've walked around the garden a little bit to see what other people had. Here's some beautiful teas growing. Look at how beautiful they are. And then some other even had corn. It's even starting to tassel. So all these things are grown with just compost and soil 
and no pesticide. Just some pictures of what came out of the garden last summer. So I got a bunch of tomatoes and peppers there on the left. I've got eggplant, more peppers, some Malabar spinach, some okra. We had so much okra, you wouldn't believe it. And some um, cream peas and lots of eggplant. So lots and lots of produce just from a tiny plot. Now, how do we grow all that good stuff without any chemical fertilizer or pesticide? Well, the secret is the compost, okay, the soil. It improves the soil. So that's a big pile of horse manure that we get from a local stable. And we, we um, let it break down a little bit. You can see if you use it just straight from the horse, to it, the plants don't like that. But this has been sitting there a while, and you can see right here a, a squash volunteer has grown up in the in the heap of, of, of horse manure, and it looks just really healthy. Okay, so that manure has broken down a little bit, and now it can be put in the garden. It's great fertilizer. So buying chemical fertilizer, you use natural things. And then here's the compost. And so you can see on the top there are some straw and some leaves and a couple of things and there's some little, little bean seasonings coming up from the beans that got thrown on there last year but over here when I dug in a little bit see the little earthworms full of earthworms see how dark that soil is that compost is all broken down okay just with the help of the earthworms and some fungi and it breaks down into wonderful wonderful soil now you can use a lot of things you can go to the store like when my my gardening neighbors there and you can buy all kinds of things that are organic that supposedly will help your garden grow better i find that just that compost and horse manure do just fine for me but but you can also there's lots of things you can buy also or on the right there's some organic pest control products that they're using some orange oil and i don't know what that is but it's all organic it's not toxic <clears throat> to the bees and the butterflies, but hopefully to whatever they're trying to control. Like the orange oil, I think they use that to try to control the dreadful fire ants. And another advantage of those organic vegetables is that dogs and everyone else can enjoy them. Okay? There's a puppy that got a big old squash out of the compost heap, and she decided that was a good toy. It's also good for the birdies. These are some birdies that were in my backyard. Okay, it's all organic in the backyard too. And they're eating insects and bugs and things. This is that brown thrasher, really an amazing big bird. And then just the other day, I saw the painted bunting. Okay, so here's a painted bunting and two females. Okay, that's a male. And they're migrating through and they're eating the tiny seeds in my garden. So lots of fun things to learn about and explore and try out in your own garden. So my advice is do a little research on how to make compost, how to make compost, how to identify the bad bugs and just squish them when you find them. That's my secret. So if you have any questions, Dr. Gorman will be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. And the question did come in. Uh, does it cost more to do organic gardening than conventional gardening? Uh, organic plants usually cost a bit more than plants grown by conventional methods and tend to be a bit smaller in size. The methods used to grow organic plants are more labor intensive and often require more space to produce the same number of plants compared to conventional nurse nurseries. All right, now. We're going to let Mr. Monroe tell you about natural methods of pest control. Hello, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be investigating natural methods of pest control. And I guess probably the best way to look at this, there is a strategy, and that strategy is called IPM which stand for Integrated Pest Management. Now, while I'm going through uh, this little uh, presentation with you, there's a couple of things I want you to really try to remember from this. 
Number one, to be able to really remember at least two of the natural pest control methods that we're going to be going over. Just might happen that your teacher will ask you what you remember from this presentation. Also, the focus is going to be on what kind of benefit natural methods of pest control can give us. Now, I'm going to uh, start by sharing my screen with you and going through a short PowerPoint that's going to give you all the information you need about IPM, the strategy to control pests by using a natural method. So bear with me while I share my screen with you. IPM, Integrated Pest Management. It's an environmental friendly and less expensive way to, of managing pests in your urban yard or even in a garden. It's made up of four key strategies. Let's go over those strategies. The cultural control strategy. And you heard Ms. Nash talk about squashing or mashing the squash bugs. Well, that's kind of like a, uh, a cultural control, but cleaning up debris where pests can hide, that's one, cleaning up dead plants in a garden so pests cannot survive and winter there, using plants that are resistant to pest damage or plants that can tolerate damage, rotating the plants in the garden from year to year so the disease doesn't build up in that spot and putting plants where they will be healthier or less attractive to pests that may want to come in. Physical control is what I was referring to Ms. Nash talking about squeezing the bugs, you know, removing insects by hand, such as plucking bag worms off the shrubs, cutting off infected portions of the plant, such as pruning a tree branches that are covered with fall webworm caterpillars, or crushing insects such as uh, insects aids, eggs and trapping to remove insects. Chemical control. This should be the last thing you should think of, not the first. When you want to control pests in your yard, use chemicals sparingly. Use chemicals only when needed. Use chemicals only where needed. And use chemicals that are easier on the environment as such as Bt. Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, those are, that 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 chemical right there is very good. It only affects the insects that would probably be in the soil. Also, horticultural oils such as neem oil. Neem oil is one of the best all-around insecticides, and it will put a damper on cabbage worms, uh, squash bugs. A variety of insects it will get rid of, and it doesn't really harm uh, beneficial insects. Also, the use of horticultural soaps is, is a very valuable instrument in controlling unwanted pests. Also, the use of insect growth regulators, IGR. Biological control. In an, undisturbed, in an undisturbed land, such as a native prairie and forest, insects and plants, they live in harmony with the numbers of insects that feed on plants kept in check by a variety of predators, diseases, and parasites. To some extent, this natural cycle can occur in your yard or even in your garden. You know, you can call for biological control or biological back, backup using the natural enemies to help manage pests below an economic level. The three Ps, predators, parasites, and pathogens. We're gonna look at those briefly. As far as predators, the helpers that you will see most often in your yard are the predators. They're usually larger than the insects they eat. They eat a lot of insects, 
They are usually fast moving and they are generalists as a rule. So they can eat pests and non-pest insects and even each other at times. Good example are lady beetles. The adult beetles are usually orange or pink without black spots, though they can also be solid black. Lady beetles are voracious eaters and eat a lot of aphids. aphids. They will also eat insect eggs and young caterpillars. Lacewings. Lacewings are the older neuropathy, ter, ter, meaning curved wings. Their larvae are so predaceous, they are called aphid lions. Lacewing adults, you see a picture there, and you also see a picture of the eggs right there. The lacewing larva, uh, larva jaws are hollow. It pierces the aphid, holds it up, and drains all, all the juices, leaving behind the empty skin. Lacewing larvae do not pop. Their diet is aphid juice, so there's little solid material. Instead, when they molt for the final time into a pupa, the larva skin contains the frass. Most lace, lace wings are predators. The most common lace wing is green, but there is also another family that is brown. The praying mantis, which we generally see those guys around. Praying mantis are generalist predators. Where is, there is no pupil stage, Mantids can look over their shoulder, which makes them an excellent predator. Here in these images, you see the egg case, the nymph, and the adult. Spiders, of course, spiders are ferocious insect eaters. There's a variety, they actively hunt, they lie in wait. Wasp, there's another predator. Wasp are efficient generalist predators. Wasp, Mud daubers, hornets, yellow jackets, cicada killers, all prey on insects. Parasitoids. Now, were, are more helpful than you less likely to see because they are so tiny. These creatures include some flies and some tiny walk. They are much smaller than the insects they eat. They usually only consume one host. They are often very picky about what insects they eat and usually are spe uh, species specific. These tiny wasps do not sting people. The female wasps or fly will lay her eggs inside of a host insect, usually the, in the egg, the larva and the pupa. Now, the young wasp fly will burrow inside the host and eat it from the inside out. When the wasp or fly is ready to pupate, the host will be killed. There are many successful parasite wasps. The wasp will lay its eggs in an aphid. The para, uh, parasitized aphid becomes swollen, brown, and dry, and is referred to as the mummy. This is a parasitic wasp looking over uh, looking over insect eggs, deciding where to lay her eggs. Wasp larvae have finished eating out the caterpillar. They will now spin cocoons pupate and emerge later as wasps, ready to lay eggs in another insect victim. This tomato hornworm is carrying around wasp pupate on its back. The wasp larvae have eaten out most of this caterpillar so it will not develop into a moth. Pathogens. Finally, there are diseases that insects can, can get referred to as pathogens. Here are some examples. These caterpillars were killed by a virus. This aphid was killed by a fungus. In fact, when it's warm and humid, the spring in the spring, many aphids and other insects are killed by funguses. Nematodes. Nematodes are tiny worms, round worms. Nematodes can be free living, but many are parasitic. Some species of nematodes are important to plants, plant pests. Pine wilt, nematodes, soybean, Christmas, and ne uh, nematodes.
Endopathic nematodes are used as biological controlled agents of insect pests. Two key con biocontrol nematodes are the Steinemer and the ambusher, known as the ambusher, and the heterohatus, which is called the hunter. Now I'm going to, I've run out of time and I have a lot to, I could have still shared with you, but we're on a time limit. So let me stop sharing my screen with you. And I'm going to turn it back over into uh, Dr. Gorman's hands. But before I go, this is what we call neem spray. And we are planning on using it on our garden for squash bugs. Now, Dr. Gorman, it's all yours. I want you guys to have a good day the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Mr. Monroe. Very interesting. And the question is, what is the best natural pesticide? That was a good question following what Mr. Monroe just did. Neem oil. This is one of the best all-purpose natural insecticides, killing everything from cabbage worms and squash bugs above ground to nematodes and grubs beneath the soil. Neem oil is a poisonous extract of the neem tree, a tropical Asian species which is widely available in garden centers. And now, Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you about xeroscaping. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about xeroscaping. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll start our presentation. I do have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So as you are uh, going through the presentation, keep these two questions in mind. The first question is, what is xeroscaping? And the second, is you should be able to give two examples of plants that can be planted in a zero scape. And the video to your left um, is actually a rain garden at Lake Highlands Community Garden in Dallas. It's the same place that Miss Nash um, has her plot and was showing you guys uh, some of those pretty pictures earlier. Uh, so if you live in Dallas and have a chance to go visit that uh, community garden, it's a great place to get some ideas um, if you wanna start your own little vegetable garden or other garden. Uh, so the video that you're seeing right now is actually the garden's bioretention area, and it consists of a planted shallow depression, and it collects rainwater runoff from the parking lot and from the roof from the nearby building, um, and it serves to reduce uh, the amount of stormwater volume uh, that gets collected in that area. And a lot of the plants that you're seeing there, um, they are native, but they're also drought resistant or drought tolerant. And sometimes you might hear another word for xeriscaping. You might uh, hear it be called water wise or water smart and gardening. Uh, so it's essentially using a landscape that requires little water or no irrigation. So it only is, needs the water uh, that it's getting from the natural climate, uh, from what that natural climate provides. Uh, so great way to save money on uh, your water bill and utilities. And hopefully as you guys were watching this video, uh, you were able to spot uh, some interesting um, plants and also uh, during the first round in the video, hopefully you spotted that cool little green anole uh, that was spotted on the pig. Uh, so on our next little slide, we're going to take a look at some different examples of zero escapes. Uh, so take a look at these four pictures, compare and contrast each type and think about what might be the pros and cons to each of these types of zero escapes. Um, feel free to pause the video to allow time for discussion and observation, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and explain it. So our first one is a classic zero escape. It's very similar to what you might already have in a normal landscaped yard. Uh, it just has a little area that's designated as a plant, um, as a plant bed for zero escaping. And um, essentially it's a great Great zero escape for starters because you still have most of your regular lawn. You're just denoting a special little area for that zero escape. The next type that we have is the cottage zero escape, and notice how it looks different from the classic one. Uh, so the cottage zero escape uses a lot of flowering plants that are drought resistant, and this type of zero escape is really beneficial for those pollinators, so our bees or butterflies. And especially if you're using native plants, uh, that would really help out a lot of our native wildlife and insects as well. Then we have our Texas natives zero escape. Um, this one looks pretty nice. This one, of course, is using our own Texas native plants. And because they're native to Texas, they are very hardy and able to survive our Texas climate. 
of course, this is a great zero skate because it supports local wildlife and our local pollinators. And again, these plants are already adapted for Texas, uh, so it's pretty low maintenance. Then we also have these desert zero scapes, which is what most people typically think of when we think of a zero scape, we typically think of those succulents. Um, so this is what typically comes to mind. Uh, again, these type of zero scapes are probably gonna be more common in uh, West Texas. I know I went to New Mexico uh, during spring break and I saw a lot of this classic uh, desert zero scape over there. Uh, so those are some of the more common types of zero scapes. Again, the classic zero scape might be good for a beginner because it's incorporating your regular lawn that you already have and it's just a smaller version of that zero scape. Now here are some examples of some native and drought resistant plants. If you are thinking about a zero scape, we have this pretty Texas sage, prickly pear, which we actually have a few of those out here in our post oak preserve. The red yucca, I actually see a lot of this red yucca in a lot of the gas station uh, little parking lots and then a uh, trailing lantana. So I'm kind of partial. I like the flowering plants more than I like the succulents. Um, and then over here, we also have flame acanthus, a beautiful bright red uh, plant. And then we have bitterweed or also called the four nerve daisy. And the park that I take my dogs to has a huge pasture full of this beautiful yellow um, it's actually a weed, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful flower. And so you can see my two dogs, Toby and Abby, trying to pose for a nice picture in that pasture. So some benefits of a zero escape. Um, of course, we know that it will help you conserve water. It lowers your water bill and will save you a lot of money in the long run. It's also very low maintenance uh, since they are drought tolerant. You don't really have to water them or provide them with fertilizer. And especially if you're using natives, they're already adjusted to living in this type of climate. Um, it can also be very versatile. So it's not necessary to zero skate your entire lawn if you just wanna start small with just a little patch of your lawn. Um, it's also aesthetically pleasing. So I think some of those landscapes look really pretty, um, especially if you incorporate some of those flowering uh, drought resistant ones as well. And then if you decide to go full blown zero scaping with your entire lard, of course you won't have to mow as much because you're gonna be uh, utilizing most of that lawn uh, for your zero scape and the rock and the mulch. Now there might be some cons though. So some cons to zero scaping would be if you're not using natives, it might not support the local wildlife in your area. There might also be some upfront costs. So for example, you might have to go and purchase those plants. Uh, you'll have to purchase the rock and the mulch as well. And then some other drawbacks, if you're used to having a lush green lawn, if you do decide to zero scape a large part of your lawn, you'll no longer have that grassy area. So if you like to picnic or if you have kids that play in the lawn, uh, you, you'll be sacrificing your lush green lawn for that zero scape. So there are some things to take into consideration when you're thinking about zero scaping. And then I have a couple of websites that you can visit if you're look, interested in looking into some drought resistant plants. One is from Lady Bird Johnson and the other one is Texas Superstar Plants List. And then I have a quick challenge for you guys. Sketch your dream zero scape, include at least eight plants and a minimum uh, must be at least four natives. So here's some examples. If you're interested in being a landscaper, here's some examples of ways that landscapers have used um, engineering and architect uh, to help them create a landscape. So think about if you were to create your own dream zero scape, what would you put in it and why? So I'm gonna go ahead and just show you those two websites really quick. Um, the first one, oops, let me pull up my, let me get that bar out of the way. Um, the first one is from the Lady Bird, uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife uh, Wildflower Center. And it has some great examples of drought resistant plants for Texas with some beautiful pictures. And then the other one is Texas Superstar Plants. It lists it by animal plants, woody shrubs, and trees. Uh, so this would be a great uh, place if you need research to do your challenge question. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, one question did come in and it came in before Ms. Ramirez just covered her last part. It said, what local plants can be used in zero scaping? Uh, cactus are far from the only plants appropriate for zero scaping. Other drought resistant plants include agave, juniper, and lavender. Many herbs and spices are used in zero scaping, such as thyme, sage, and oregano. And now Ms. Fuller is gonna tell us about solar panels. 
Hello, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Fuller. And in this box, I have the amount of carbon my car puts into the atmosphere every day on my way to work and then back again this much. So what can I do to lessen my carbon footprint? Well, one of the ways that I chose was uh, put solar panels on my roof. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to go through the pros and cons of solar panels. So, so all the solar panels are photovoltaic cells that produce electricity. This, these are the panels that are on the roof on my house. They're on the part of the roof that faces south. I also have some on the east facing roof, but not very many. Okay, so here's some essential questions. How can solar panels help a household and what are they made of? So why would you install solar panels? Number one, to help slow global warming. That's my purpose. I, I want to lessen my carbon footprint. Uh, number two, to lower your electric bill. Number three, to increase your property value. It makes your house more valuable. And number four, to help the U.S. achieve somewhat energy independence. So we, we know we have a warming uh, climate uh, globally and we need to stop putting so much carbon in the air. So what are solar panels made of? They're made of photovoltaic cells, which are made primarily of silica. It's the same thing that sand is made of. And then additionally, plastic, aluminum, glass, and some contain lead, and they can be recycled. About 50% of all solar panels are made in China, but most of the panels that are made in Europe, US, and Japan are made of components that are manufactured in China. And they're not perfect. Uh, they uh, do prevent carbon from being put in the atmosphere through carbon dioxide by the burning of fossil fuels. My solar panels on my house, uh, we've had them since November of 2019, I believe. They have prevented 17.2 tons of carbon from entering the air. Now, where are they placed? Generally, they're placed on the south facing uh, part of the roof or east. Uh, each area has its own specific angle uh, optimal for optimal uh, electricity genera uh, generation and shade produced by large trees, tall buildings, or physical landscape may affect these choices. If you'll look at these two pictures, you'll see that both of these uh, solar arrays have shading on them from trees. So the, the best place is put it someplace where it's not gonna get shade. Now, how much savings can a homeowners expect? Solar panels are a long haul enterprise. You do not realize financial gains for years after you install them. When you decide to install solar panels, you must have an eye to the future at the end of their use. They usually uh, wear out about 20 or 25 years after you install them. You will essentially have broken even. So you're not making money hand over fist because we look at the bottom of the little chart, you see where it says solar payment. They're very expensive. I paid about $45,000 for mine. So I'm gonna be paying for that for a very long time, which is gonna offset any uh, savings on my monthly bill. So why buy solar? Your biggest reason for buying solar is to save the atmosphere from overheating. Monetary gains are nice, but breathing is nicer still. Now, what if I can't afford solar panels? There are other ways to lessen your carbon footprint. Number one, plant trees. Trees uh, capture carbon and store it in their trunks. They also pr produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Number two, recycle. Number three, compost. Number four, don't waste food. America has a terrible reputation for food wasting. Number five, don't waste water. Uh, refer back to number four. Number six, eat a plant-based diet. Number seven, grow a garden, just like Ms. Nash told you about. And number eight, take public transportation. So I have an energy challenge for you that'd be very easy to do and be fun. Did you know that your school district, Dallas ISD, has a Department of Energy and Sustainability? 
Did you know principals, teachers, students, and office staff have assigned roles and responsibilities? Go to do the Dallas ISD website, investigate this department, and find out what you can do to help your school district be conservation-minded. My time is up. I'm going to turn you back to Dr. Gorman. So he will answer any questions that you have about solar panels. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Question is, do you use batteries in solar panels? Okay, your solar PV system will not operate during a power outage without a battery. The 26% tax credit for solar applies to energy storage as long as the battery is being charged by the solar panels. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Nash. And now we're gonna turn it over to Ms. Jackie and she's gonna do a program called electronics recycling. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Um, yes, we are going to meet uh, Ms. Jackie from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality in uh, just a minute here, but I'm just gonna show you their website real quick first. Uh, it is tceq.texas.gov and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality um, monitors the air, land, and water here in Texas and helps us take care of our land, air, and water here so that we can um, live uh, healthy lives. And they do a little bit more too. So Ms. Jackie is gonna explain um, how to recycle electronics because it's a little different than recycling uh, paper and plastic. So here is Ms. Jackie. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or the TCEQ for short, is the state of Texas's Environmental Protection Agency. We help monitor the environment for air, water, and waste pollution. The TCEQ has different sections or moving parts that work together to make sure that our air, waterways, and land remain clean. Hi, I'm Jackie, and I work in the Pollution Prevention and Education Program of the TCEQ. Our team maintains special programs designed to prevent pollution, like the Texas Recycles TVs and Computers programs, which provide great resources for Texans looking to properly dispose of their electronics. Speaking of electronics, have you ever purchased a new phone, looked at the old one and thought, what do I do with this now? Well, you're not alone. It can be confusing when an item doesn't necessarily go into the trash recycle compost bins that we're used to. Electronics, which basically include any item with an electrical cord or that is powered by batteries, cannot go into your standard recycling bin. Standard recycling facilities are not set up to process complex technology like phones and computers. So what to do with that device? Well, that's a good question. But first, let's check out some facts. Okay, so in 2018, Texas created 884,000 tons of electronic waste. That's the weight of like almost a quarter of a million elephants. Yeah, that's a problem. And underneath the plastic and aluminum casings of our devices are a variety of toxic elements such as lead and mercury. When electronics that reach the end of their life are not properly disposed of, those toxic elements do have the potential to harm the environment in all kinds of ways. Well, that's the not so good news, but never fear, good news is here. And that good news is, there's something you can do about it. Now, I'll bet you've probably got a general idea of how to recycle paper, plastics, and cans. So that's an excellent start. But here's how you can reduce, reuse, and recycle your electronics. Reduce your waste. Acquiring the newest model of everything sure can be tempting, but consider hanging on to your device for a little longer before tossing the old one out just to buy a new one. Less consumption means less to throw away. It's that simple. Reuse wherever possible. Believe it or not, hand-me-downs work great for electronics too. If you know someone who'll let you have their unused or unwanted devices, go for it. And if you're worried about loading speed and efficiency, look into ways you can adapt your device. 
purchasing refurbished items, well, that's a great idea too. And recycle. Conduct an internet search for your local electronics recyclers. You can drop off your electronics at the facility and they'll recycle your devices responsibly. When you reduce, reuse, and recycle your electronics, tons of great things happen. Like the diversion of excess waste out of our landfills, meaning we can use the same landfills longer. That's a plus. Another thing, less energy and resources are used. For example, removing precious metals from old devices and then reusing them in new ones, well, that cuts down on mining new natural resources from the earth. And there are the economic benefits too. According to the 2017 study on the economic impacts of recycling, the Texas electronics recycling industry directly contributed over $125 million to the Texas economy. Here are some other helpful tips. Utilize the TCQ website for electronics recycling information. Contact the retailer or the store that you purchased your device from. Some retailers have a take back program and they'll collect your electronics for you in store. And if your electronic device is in good working condition, please consider donating to a local charity, school or nonprofit organization. In conclusion, what do you do with that old phone, gaming console or computer that's way out of date? Reduce, reuse and recycle. Go online and check out the Texas Recycles TVs and Computers programs, which, by the way, have reported that more than 18 million pounds of electronics have been collected from consumers in 2020. See, you're on the right track. And teach your friends and family about how they can properly dispose of their electronics. Thanks for doing your part to take care of Texas. And thank you the, to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and especially to Ms. Jackie for sharing all about electronics recycling uh, with us. And now I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here and turn things back over to Dr. Gorman. Thank you, Mr. Broughton and Ms. Jackie. And now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students explored the advantages and disadvantages of going green, such as organic gardening and farming, natural methods of pest control, hydroponics, zero scaping, energy efficient homes and appliances, and hybrid cars. Ms. Nash talked to you about organic gardening. Mr. Monroe covered natural methods of pest control. Mr. Ramirez, zero scaping. Ms. Fuller, solar panels, and Ms. Jackie, told you about electronics recycling. Thank you. Teachers, how did we do? You would go to www.towny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a short form and send to us. We'd appreciate it. Uh, we want you to have a great rest of the day. But more importantly, we want you to have a great rest of your life. Thank you.